comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Father, we ask that you would speak to us this morning through these words, that you would be given the glory. Above all things, Father, that as we submit to your word, as we submit to you, that you would speak to us, you would guide us, you would encourage us, you would convict us. Father, so that we might, as your people, follow you, love you, and be your people always. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. It is a good day because we've got air conditioning. Amen, amen. Uh, Today's passage in Galatians Uh, I think, I think is, we can easily, like a lot of scripture, we can easily over, just gloss over it. Or we can read it and go, amen, amen, yay. And not sit back and really dwell on what God is saying through these words. That as we've been working through the book of Galatians, if, if we haven't noticed, its focus is not us. Yes, he's speaking to Believers, he's speaking to the church, but the center of it is not the church. The center of it is Christ. The center of it is the glory of God. The center of it is his word. The center of it is God himself. And the church, as the church, we revolve around him. We don't revolve around us, our preferences. We don't revolve around our desires and our will. We revolve around God's will, God's desires, his word, his truth, not our own. And when we look at our lives as the church, as believers, if we revolve our life, if you want to bring it down to the gospel, that we are saved by grace through faith, no work of ourselves, only through the work and the grace of God himself, through his son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross. When we revolve our life around that, what happens is we become small. Because what have I contributed to my salvation? Christ has done it all. And that then affects everything in our life. Not just coming on Sunday morning, but what we say throughout the week. How we act. How we live our life. I know school's almost done. How we do our homework. And we do it on time because... That's what's required of us. I know it sounds simple, right? Like, oh, that's just, this just following rules. Well, no, because who we are is not defined by us. It's by Christ. That means our life is going to reflect that. And when we make a promise, we keep it. When we have responsibilities, we keep it. When we are injured, we don't injure back. When we are not loved, we love back. Our life as Christians is dramatically and drastically different from an unbelieving world. And if an unbelieving world cannot see the difference between us and themselves, that doesn't make us better. It just makes us saved. (laughs) But if they don't see a difference then I don't think we're living the life that Christ has called us to. Now, that doesn't mean you got two extremes. Then you've got like the holier than thou, you're a jerk. And then you've got the, you know, always, always letting them do whatever they want and being like, oh, that's okay, that's okay, and being nice and loving. And you can go the two extremes. But what Paul is trying to teach these Galatians is, is they have lost their first love, if you want to say. They have missed the gospel. They've walked away from the gospel. Their life now is revolved around rules and, and obeying the law. And that's how I'm going to be made right in the eyes of God. And Paul's like, ah, you're already made right in the, right in the eyes of God. You don't need to act this way or obey God or look at the law and read the law and try to obey the law in order to make God like you. 
He already likes you. He's already justified you. He's already saved you. So now, because of that, you love him, and now you want to obey him. So our obedience is not out of gaining God's love or gaining God's affection. Instead, it's I'm obeying him and his desires and his will because I love him. It comes from a heart that God creates within us. And that's what a world will, the world will see, is that kind of heart. Our world is totally consumed by so many things. And none of them are God. None of them. A lot of them are really good. That's really good stuff. Family, making enough money to provide, taking time off so that you don't go crazy. You know, like all these, these are all really good things, but, but that's not who we are as God's people. We're different. We're different. We don't see money the same way. We don't see vacations the same way. We don't see work the same way. We don't see life the same way. We don't, we don't gather here. We see this differently than the world. The world sees a bunch of weirdos singing songs together to something they can't see. Like, where else does this happen? ACDC concert, right? But, I mean, they're up stage, right? I mean, it's, they're on there. You see them. This is, this is weird. This doesn't happen anywhere else in our world. Why do we do it? Why do we do it? It's because of God. He saved us as his people. And we want the world to see that. We're not hindered by the things of this world. It, it doesn't hold on to us. It doesn't satisfy us. It doesn't control us anymore, the things of this world. God controls us. And he says, you, you don't need to follow the things of this world. Or as Paul was saying, you don't, you don't need to follow the law in order to be saved. You're already saved. That can have an effect on us as Christians where we start to, well, how do you say, spiritually cannibalize one another. It's a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty vivid picture, isn't it? Those who believe in Christ were free from the requirements of works for justification. We're free from having to do all of these things in order to be approved and righteous before God. But that same freedom can lead down two paths. An opportunity for the spirit or an opportunity for the flesh. One leads to spiritual growth and love. The other leads to spiritual cannibalism. What is freedom in Christ? We say we're different. We're not held down by the things of this world as the world is. We can let go of those things. When we just sing a song, like, and that day comes and, and I'm lying in my grave and God raises me from the dead. I'm going to sing praises with a new voice, a different voice than what? What I used to. That's what we look forward to. That's what we, as, as Christians, that's, that's our goal. We can't wait until Christ comes or until we're in his presence. But while we're here, we have freedom. Because of that, we have freedom. In chapter 4, Paul uses slavery to describe the law of Moses and freedom to describe the grace of God through Christ. Those who submit to the law for their justification, for their salvation— are slaves to the whole law. But those who submit to the grace of God for their justification, they're free. The Christian is free from these requirements to be made right before God and no longer enslaved to the requirements of the law. This freedom, though, this bond that is broken, it's no longer a, a burden. It, it talks about that, that yoke of slavery and Jesus says, put my yoke on you, my grace upon you. My burden is light. The law is heavy. This freedom is not from ourselves. It's a freedom to which we are called. Did you see that? Verse 13, for you were called to freedom. It's a freedom that we did not earn ourselves. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. 
It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And usually that's where we end. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But verse 10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He saved us to do good works. His good works that he planned beforehand. We contributed nothing to our salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Our freedom from the law is from God, by God, and for God. Where am I in that equation? Nowhere. Nowhere. He provided the salvation. He gave us the salvation. Also that he would be glorified through us. And because he is the one who called us to this freedom, we have to be careful to use our freedom for his glory, not our glory. For as wonderful as freedom is, it also provides opportunities that if not recognized could steer us down a path that is not healthy and is not good. As Paul puts it, to biting, devouring, and consuming one another as a church. Our freedom in being justified before God by the works and grace of Christ alone can easily lead us down the path of our flesh. That's what Paul says, an opportunity for the flesh. The word flesh points to our fallen human nature. The part of us that is unable to conform to God's holy ex expectations of perfect obedience to his commands and his desires. We all know this. As Christians, we, well, what well, does Paul say in another book? Like, I know what I got to do and I want to do it, but I can't do it. And it frustrates me that I can't obey God like I want to. And I know it's wrong. I do what I don't want to do when I do what I should do, what I want to do. I mean, he, that's his heart. And we all live that. We all understand that. We want to do it, but we can't. We struggle to do it. That's our flesh. Our flesh is the foothold which sin so easily grasps a hold of in our life. Our freedom from the requirements of the law for our righteousness can easily be taken advantage, by, and advantage of by our flesh. For if we're not required to live according to the law for our salvation, then maybe we can live however we want. If I'm saved by grace through faith, then any sinful disobedience of God is going to be forgiven by God, right? Yeah, absolutely. But we have to make sure we don't go too far with it. I knew a young man in college who would live his life in whatever way possible, doing whatever he desired, no exceptions. He lived, he lived to the fullest, if you want to say. He felt free to do this because once a week he would confess his sins to a priest in order to be forgiven. He could live whatever life he chose as long as he confessed it once a week. And then he was living on a clean slate and in a state of grace before God. This is what Paul is warning against. Our freedom in Christ does not give us permission to do whatever we want. Yes, God is always faithful to forgive us our sins if we truly repent, but we should not use our freedom as a Christian as an opportunity for the flesh. The Galatian churches are obviously divided, a, a division created by those who taught justification by circumcision and the law. Some divisions in the church are actually healthy. For example, we've talked about this the last couple of weeks. Should anybody be unrepentantly teaching something contrary to the primary teachings of Scripture, the truth of God's Word, and they're teaching against it, and they do not repent of that when they are corrected, they should be removed from any fellowship with the church body. That means not coming to church that means encouraging and telling the, the, the people of the church, do not fellowship with this person. Now that's harsh, right? That's scriptural, but it's harsh. Why do we do that? So that they miss the church and that God convicts them and that they would come back and be restored to the church and the church would come in and say, absolutely. 
You are our brother. You are our sister, and we love you. That's, that's where a good division happens in order for the glory of God to be seen. Divisions, though, based on a fellow believer being sidetracked or deceived on a doctrine or teaching, or you have a different preference as to what color carpet. You know, everybody laughs at that one, but that's churches have split over the color of carpet. It's dumb, but they do it. Things like that. That is what Paul means by biting and devouring one in order, another in order to destroy, consume one another. Divisions based on anger or hatred towards a brother or sister in Christ will only destroy the bonds of fellowship in a church body. And it's in stark contrast to the freedom that we have been called to and given in Christ. There's a battle in each of us as Christians, a battle between our flesh and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the flesh wins and we mourn and we lament our disobedience and our weakness. And sometimes the spirit wins and we praise and worship God, giving him the glory. This is the battle that Paul is referring to here in these verses. He says, be mindful not to use your freedom as an opportunity to the flesh to devour and bite and consume one another, but instead as an opportunity for the spirit to work. You are free in Christ. You're not held down by the yoke of the law and the burden of perfect obedience. Use that freedom to glorify God. The freedom found in and given in Christ is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to move in us and change us. This is what's called sanctification in Scripture. To be made more and more into the image of Christ. To live a life and, and express a life or be shown as living a life. And your heart is changed to be more like Christ in the way that we act and we speak, the way that we think. Where the flesh gives a desire to divide and destroy the church, the spirit actually gives the desire to serve the church. This type of service is not one born out of ourselves, but out of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It is extremely difficult when you, as a Christian in the church, you have a beef with another person and you guys don't like, have we ever seen that in church? People just don't like each other and one sits over there and one sits over there, right? And they don't talk to each other. It probably is because their great grandfathers didn't like each other. Been there, done that. I've seen that. Well, our grandfathers didn't like each other, so we don't like them. Why? Well, because his great grandfather hurt my great grandfather. Are we five? That's what it feels like. That's division. That's division. But to have the spirit to serve the church means serving that person who despises you, maybe. They're a believer. You've you've got a beef together, but you serve one another. It's a service not born out of us, right? It's out of the Holy Spirit in us. It's a service, service born out of the love that Christ has shown us, which is why Paul says, through love, serve one another. He doesn't say, through the goodness of your heart, serve one another. He doesn't say, through your feelings, serve one another. Because if you really don't like somebody, the last thing you, oh, you want me to serve out of my feelings? You want to do something out of my feelings? It ain't going to be service, right? That's where our heart is. That's the reality. I mean, you may be like, well, that's just you, Mark. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. But... If we are to live a life allowing our freedom for the opportunity for the Spirit to work in us, then our flesh will be set aside. Our flesh uses our freedom in Christ to create division. The Spirit creates service. Creates selflessness. Why? Why? Because of the love that we have received from Christ. Jesus says in John chapter 15, this is my commandment. He's speaking to his disciples. That you love one another. Uh, Most people stop there, right? 
He said, you need, to, you need to love each other. But he doesn't stop there. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love have no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And Paul even reminds the Galatians of Christ's sacrifice for them when he writes in chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, How I'm living my life is not determined by how I feel or what you have done to me. How I live my life is determined by the fact that Christ is in me and that Christ has saved me. Instead of division, unity. And not a unity based on our love, but on Christ's love for us. The Judaizers truly believed that circumcision would justify one before God. And Paul reminds them, of what the law actually says. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that one commandment, not circumcision, fulfills 25% of the law. Did you guys catch that? Just making sure you guys are awake. No, the whole law. The whole law. Loving one another as Christ loved us is the evidence of our justification of our salvation. It is the evidence of the transformative power of the indwelling Holy Spirit within me. And anybody can divide. Anybody can divide. But only a child of God can love as Christ loved, willingly giving up his life for his friends. So for me, if you've offended me, and I'm like, I ain't gonna love that person. He hurt my feelings. All I need to do as a Christian is think back and go, Okay, where was my standing with Christ when he died on the cross? Oh, I was an enemy who hated and despised. I didn't just hurt his feelings. I literally killed him on the cross. And he did it willingly because he loved me, despite me, despite my sin, despite my hatred of him. He died for me while I was still his enemy. And I can't forgive my brother in Christ who may have offended me because he said something hurtful or she said something hurtful. Or I just don't like her personality. I hate to say it, Christ probably didn't like our personality either when he died on the cross. Anybody can divide, but only a true child of God can love as Christ has loved. If we are called to freedom in Christ then we will serve one another through the love of Christ in us. Any correction that is done out of humility and selflessness with a willingness to check the log in my own eye before pointing out the speck in my brother or sister's eye. You know what, you know what that means? You know, we, we look at say, well, what is the log and what's the speck? It's a way of, if I see a brother or sister who's sinning or I've got an issue with that person, excuse me, I need to go and I need to correct them. But before I go, I need to look at my own heart because the reality probably is, is I've got just as much sin to deal with. And what's usually the response? If you come to somebody and say, I point, I see a sin in your life and I want to help you walk through this. Usually it is, oh yeah, well, you're not perfect either. And if you've already done a self-inspection of the log that's in your eye, you go, yeah, I know. And I want you to help me with that. But right now, let's deal with this, and then I want to help you with this, and then let's work together. I mean, how often do you see that happen? Not very often, right? Because the flesh grabs a hold of this freedom that we have, and we don't allow the Spirit to take over. Our selfishness and our our self-centeredness and our self-glorification take over. And we miss the point of why we even exist as a church. Any teaching that's done out of humility with the desire to reveal the greatness and the glory of God, not ourselves, is where the Spirit is revealed through our freedom. Any serving that is done out of 
a realization that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us, and so I can serve my enemy, my brother who I don't have a good relationship with or who has offended me, speak kindly to them, to love them. God loved us before we ever loved him. His love for us pointed us to himself. And so our love for one another is to point us to more of Christ, to make him great and us small. So we read these words of Paul and it says, through love serve one another. We think, oh, my love for you. No, he's saying through the love of Christ in you, you serve. What that means is probably you're not gonna love that person at that time in and of yourself. We're not gonna love each other as we should, but because Christ is in us, we love out of his love. And what, what happens when, when that happens? What, what's the result? When we love out of Christ and not of, out of our own love, like I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna love this person when I feel like it and I'm good and ready to love that person. When we, when we do that, it makes us big and God small. But when we relinquish and we release through our freedom, the fact that, you know what? You can hate me all you want, but I'm gonna love you anyway. How I view myself, my identity is not found in you. I'm loving you, not because you deserve it, because you've loved me back, but because Christ loved me and I wanna show you the love of Christ. I want you to see Christ in me. And when that happens, he increases and we decrease. When we find that we are seeking our own glory and not his, then we need to pray and submit our hearts to him. We need to confess our self-glorification and God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He says that. We are called by Christ, brothers and sisters, to freedom. But we must be careful that our gifted freedom does not lead to spiritual cannibalism. The moment that we think that we're better than somebody else, we need to remind ourselves, compared to Christ, we're all on the same page. Serving one another through the love that Christ has given to us when an unbelieving world sees that? What does Christ say? They will know you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Now, what does that mean? It means that we're gonna look different to the world. We're gonna be weird to the world. We're gonna, we're gonna love one another. We're gonna sacrifice for one another, not because the pastor has forced you, not because the leadership has said, well, you need to give up a certain percentage of what you own and what you have, or you have to give a certain percentage for this, or you have to serve here, or you have to do this, and you need to do this. Not because of that. We serve because Christ died for us and did the ultimate service for us. We serve out of a willingness to serve for the goodness and the greatness of God alone, for Christ alone, and for his glory and the unbelieving world sees that and they say, now I may not agree with their theology. I may not agree with what they say, but man, those people love Jesus. They love Jesus. What was the greatest Christian album ever created in all time? Jesus Freak by DC Talk, right? Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Jesus freak. You know, it's used as a negative a lot of times, right? And the more, I remember as a kid listening to this, just absolutely loving it. And I started to think, okay, well, what's the words? Should we, should we sing it together? No. What would people think if they knew that I was a Jesus freak? What would people do if they found it was true? 
When people see Elm Creek, now they may call us Jesus freaks, but that might be a badge of honor for us. Now you could be a Jesus freak who's a jerk, right? Now you can always, we're humans, like we could skew everything that's good and make it sinful, right? But if we truly love Jesus, that is gonna be reflected in not just what we do in the ministries, but how we act, how we speak, how we treat one another and how we treat the world with patience because we've been shown much patience, with mercy because we've been shown much mercy, corrected with, out of humility and love because that's what Christ did for us. He corrected us, did he not? When we came to Christ, did he not stand before us and say, you are a dirty dog sinner and there's no way you can get to heaven. So I died for you so that you can. But you have to admit that you're a sinner and you need me. And when we did that and we realized it, he saved us. And when we correct one another, when we serve one another, when we love one another, we don't do it to make Elm Creek great. We do it to make him great great. Now we struggle with that. We're not perfect in it. Man, a lot of times we fail. Hey, Luke even just said, like, we screw up how many times in our life? That's the reality of being human and our flesh taking control. But if we love Christ, man, we're going to strive over and over again. We're going to take correction. We're going to serve and we're going to love one another. And the world is going to see that. And even if they disagree with what we believe in, they're going to say, those people are Jesus freaks because we can see that they're serving Christ and not themselves. Why, why are you serving me? Because you love me? Yeah, well, why do we love him? Because Christ loved us. And we want people to see, not Elm Creek. I don't, we don't want people, we should not want, maybe say, we shouldn't want people to see Elm Creek. We shouldn't want people to see me as believers. We need to reflect him and his glory. We are called by Christ to freedom. And Paul is is begging the church. He's asking the church to remember your freedom wasn't really free. It was given at a price for you, not because you earned it, not because you deserve it, but because you needed it. And when we look at one another and we get irritated, or even if we serve one another and we do it well, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we doing it out of our love for Christ? Are we doing it to lift him up? Because when an unbelieving world sees the love that we have for one another, they will know who we belong to. They will know. It'll be obvious. So we have to ask ourselves the questions. If we look at our own hearts, okay, don't, don't think about other people in the room or outside the room or family members, your spouse or whatever. Look at your own heart. Or your kids, don't look at your kids either. Look at your own heart. And kids, think of your own heart. Am I living this out? Where am I failing? What do I need to give over to God? What do I need to work harder at, not to to earn it, like in my own, if I just was more disciplined, then I'd be able to do it. No, it's discipline founded upon the grace of Christ. And it's a lifelong process. What do they say? Habits created in what, eight weeks, something like that? Whatever. I I have struggled with the same sins from the moment I became a believer. 38 years, 37 years ago. 37 years, I've wrestled with the same sin. Can everybody else say amen? So no matter how much discipline I have, that Panera is still calling my name. In fact, I walked over there and smelled it before I walked in, okay? I have problems. And if I just discipline myself, that helps. But in the end, it's going to falter. But if I trust the grace of God, if I, if I do it for his glory, I might still struggle. I probably will struggle to the day that I die and I go into heaven. But I'm going to do it for him and not myself. I'm going to do it for him and not myself. 
show grace, show love, show mercy, show patience, confess sin. And all of it is for whose glory? God's, Christ. He's the center. And so from this moment until the day that you die, you have no excuse. Now you know, as a Christian, your life is to be lived for the glory of God and not yourself. And from this moment to the day we die, it is a battle and it is a fight against the flesh to make sure to work hard so that we don't give it an opportunity to devour one another, to bite one another. Who do we like to irritate the most? Family, right? Welcome to the family. We tend to just, Ah, oh, man, we like to just poke and prod and devour one another. Because, you know, they're going to forgive me. They've got to love me, right? We're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for his glory. And when the world sees that, my prayer, my hope is that they would turn to him, see our imperfections, see our stupidity, and go, yeah, but man, they love Christ. They've got something. They love each other despite each other. Whew, I want that. I want that. May that be true for us as God's church here at Elm Creek. Father, I pray. Father, I pray that you would make this real to us, these words of Paul, that we would fight the battle to not devour one another, not to consume or destroy one another. God, that we would out of humility remember what you did for us to love one another, not because we've earned it or deserve it, but because you have loved us and you command us to love one another out of your goodness and your greatness. Thank you, God, for, for sending your son while we were still enemies. You sent your son to die for us. May we remember that as we write emails and have conversations and eat meals together and have uh, 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 talks over Twitter, um, Facebook posts, uh, everything in our life, Father. Going to school, going to work, may it all, Father, as your people, may we remember that it is all for your glory. And when struggles arise and an opportunity for the flesh comes that, Father, we would remind ourselves we are free in you. But may your spirit consume us, Father, so that we might live the life that you have called, that you have called us to live. For your goodness and for your glory, may people see you and not us. May you increase and may we decrease. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Why don't you stand? We'll sing our final song. This closing song is a, it's a Christmas carol, which, you know, insert jokes about warm temperatures and wishing it was cooler, but uh, it's actually really fitting for today. Uh, the first verse reminds us that Christ came to save us. The second verse reminds us that he is our hope. And the third verse reminds us that he, is, he unifies his people. So he came to save us. He is our hope, and he unifies his people. So uh, think of those themes as we sing through this.
God's people. We are made God's people by Christ. Our identity is found in Christ. And now we are to live our life. This is what he's going to deal with the rest, of this, uh, the rest of this book in Galatians. We are to live the life of Christians by Christ's power. We cannot do it on our own. We have to trust in him. That's why we do this benediction at the end, to go in the power of Christ, to go in the power of God. Without it, we cannot live the life that God has called us to. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen? Amen.